Hey guys, welcome back. This is James and today we're going to be making a A4 document holder, a very simple project. And uh, if you're starting off in Leathercraft and want to learn how to make your own patterns, this is a great starter project for you guys out there. I'm going to make it out of just simple one piece of vegetable tanned leather. It's 1.2 millimeters thick vegetable tanned leather. And to show you just how simple making the pattern for this would be for you guys, um, this is it. This is my pattern today. They're very simple. I'm going to walk you through the measurements that I chose. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, this is a very good exercise for people who are new to the craft and wanting to uh, start making their own patterns because it's a very simple exercise, nice and flat, nice and neat, one single piece. So just take your time and uh, have fun. So let's get going. This is a brand new piece of vegetable turned leather and I love working with this stuff because it takes dyes beautifully. Um, now I'm just going to measure out the size I need and give it a quick marking on the back and cut because I don't want to use the whole thing and I don't want to use too much. I don't want to waste any of this material. So let's go ahead and mark out my measurements. Just a quick idea. It doesn't need to be perfect at this point. So my measurement is going to be 33 centimeters on the wide side. So I've got 37 here. There we go. And it's going to be a bit long. It's going to be 62 centimeters long and you'll see why it's this long uh, in in a few minutes, basically. Let's get this out. So I've got 50 here. I'm just going to mark out roughly 50. And I'm going to give myself another 20 just for uh, safety. I won't need this much, but it will give me a bit of extra leeway. And this is about, that's about another 20. There we go. So now that we've got the piece that we're going to be working with, let's just make sure we've got our measurements once more. So I need 33 all down the length of it. So I'm absolutely fine for that. Good. And I need 62. And uh, yeah, loads of room for that. So we're set for dyeing. I always like to cover the surface I'm working with um, with a just a simple piece of cardboard. This was taken from an Amazon box, um, nothing fancy, just a piece of cardboard that I know that uh, if it gets dirty and when it gets dirty, I really don't care. Um, so make sure you keep your surfaces as clean as possible because that will avoid any problems later on um, down the line. Now, do note that these uh, pieces of leather often have bits and scratches to it, especially the vegetable tanned leather. It, this is simply because, well, the animal uh, has lived a full life and sometimes it comes with uh, scratches from its life. You could work around this. In this case, I'm not going to because I, I, I always like the addition of that. It's just part of the natural look of the leather. And uh, personally, I really like it. But um, if that's not to your taste, then you can certainly work around it. It would re mean removing quite a bit for me if I wanted to get something absolutely perfect, which is not the case in this, this uh, product. Um, if I wanted to get something absolutely perfect, I'd have to remove a lot of material and that would mean a lot of waste. Um, but in my case, I'm going to see if I can work around it. Maybe I don't need this whole extra piece here. Um, we'll see how this turns out, but if it does end up to be in the piece, then I'm not too worried about that. Whenever I dye a piece, I like to use some Neatsfoot oil first on it, simply because the dyeing process is going to dry out the piece considerably. So to avoid any problems with the leather later on cracking and becoming too brittle, I like to go ahead and use some Neatsfoot oil. Uh, it also means that I think, theoretically, now this is a theory that remains to be proved, but uh, having the oil permeate into the leather helps draw the pigments from the dye into the leather. So in theory, this helps not only keep the leather nice and supple, but also helps with the dyeing process overall. You don't want to add too much oil because I believe it can make the piece go rancid. But uh, you do want just a bit, just to make sure it's nice and moisturized. So a light coat is more than sufficient here.
don't worry if it's not absolutely perfect at this point. Uh, the important part is just to get it just a bit, you know, well covered. Uh, you don't also have to worry too much about the edges since we'll be cutting slightly smaller than this actual piece. Uh, but do make sure you get most of it just to give yourself as much leeway as possible. I'm going to be using Fibing's Saddle Tan uh, Pro Dye in Saddle Tan colour. The Saddle Tan should give it a nice rich golden colour and uh, I will be using a decent amount. Um, I could dilute it. Actually, I will dilute it simply because this will give me more to work with. So let's get uh, a proper container and dilute this stuff. To dilute my dyes, I use ethanol absolute, uh, which is basically pure alcohol. It's uh, industrial grade, so be very careful, and you don't want to um, you don't want to smell the fumes too much. I go for a simple. It's a bit much. I go for a simple 50-50 mix, more or less. This is not absolutely not an absolute science. Uh, if you want to do things properly, you probably should. You probably definitely can, but this is not the way I'm doing it. But yeah. So do be careful because the alcohol, like this, will evaporate and the fumes are not good for you because they burn out your lungs basically. Uh, same thing for the saddle town in, in all fairness, with the dye. There we go. That looks good. I like to keep these old jars simply because you can close them up and reuse whatever you haven't finished with. Um, I will, actually I'll do it now. What I like to do is take a marker and write down what it is. Saddle tan, 50% mix. Now it goes without saying that as of this point you have to be extremely careful not to get any drops or any of this onto your project because that could seriously ruin it. You have to really go slowly. Trust me, I've made so many mistakes in the past um, and even by being very careful mistakes, well, mistakes still can be made. So just take your time, don't rush. This is a slow process and it needs to be slow. Now the reason I diluted is so that I can actually go ahead and do several passes of this. As you can see the dye in the first coat is definitely not a uniform dye and you'll want to do several coats of it. But if you're using the dye pure, the issue you may encounter is therefore using too much and your piece becoming too dark. Uh, this is why I dilute it. But be careful because the extra alcohol or whatever you use to dilute it will dry out the leather even more. Uh, as you're putting on more coats, it stands to the logic that your leather is going to be more and more dry. So take your time, test this out if you're not used to it, and find what works for you. Uh, every leather is different. Dif different suppliers will have different types of leather and different qualities of leather. This is what works for me. You're more than welcome to try it out for yourself. If, if anything, I invite you to try it out yourself and find what works for you. But this is what works for me. Don't assume it will work for you necessarily the same way. Um, do test it out, enjoy, take your time and learn as you go, discover basically. So the first coat, as you see, is not brilliant. Uh, that's normal, totally normal. And this is why I diluted it because I wanted it to be very light. I don't want it to go too dark. Um, I'll be putting on a second coat and a third coat probably. Um, if not, definitely. I always do three coats anyway. And this, as you'll see, uh, progressively, the colour will be more and more even as it dries out. And by having something that's diluted, you can go ahead and redo areas that may need doing again if they're slightly lighter than other places without too much worry. OK, let's get going.
There we go guys, at this point I'm pretty happy with the way the die is uh, looking. Um, as you can see, there are still some marks where the die has taken a bit more than other places, this is totally normal. And uh, these will fade quite substantially within the next 10-15 minutes, and they'll fade even more as time goes by, and especially it will all be uh, sort of... Um, it will quickly become part of the pattern, especially once you start applying things like waxes and other things, other products, as you use your, your leather item. Um, so don't worry about these faint lines, that is totally normal. If you want to go ahead and do more coats of dye, definitely you can. Again, be, be, be aware that this can dry out your leather. So there are several things you could be using now. I'm going to wait a few minutes, let this dry, and then probably use uh, one quick coat of Saphir Renovateur, just simply because I want to get some of those oils back in, and this will start giving it waxes. Or you could go ahead and use a Saphir Pad Deluxe or another another type of polish that you may want to use on this leather. Um, I'm going to test out that on a corner and uh, we'll come back in a second. Guys, I've given this a few minutes to dry and I think I will go with the Saphir Renovateur instead of the Saphir Pad Deluxe. Either one of these products, products uh, will work great. I mean, I do tend to use this one quite a lot, but because I've used quite a good amount of uh, of dye on this. I really want to make sure it stays nice and supple for the use simply because it will be turned around. It's just one piece that's folded around. So I want to make sure it's as supple as possible. If it were several pieces all laid flat with no stretching, no turning, then I wouldn't worry too much and I'll probably just go ahead and use this. But because I want it to be especially flexible, I'm going to make sure it's got all the oils that it needs, hence the Saphir Renovateur. Um, this may be overkill, for many people it would be overkill, but this is what I like to do. Um, definitely try things out at home, as always. So yeah, using the Saphir Renovateur with my fingers directly, I am using gloves though, um, the idea being that you can apply it more evenly like this, and that the heat of your fingers helps distribute the oils and the waxes around the piece. And there you go guys, I think uh, this is looking really good. As you can see, the uh, colours are looking much more subtle right now. Uh, you can still see where the different dye uh, strokes have been applied, but it's not at all as visible as it was just a few minutes back. Um, and again, this is the kind of thing that will uh, gradually fade away and become more uniform as time goes by, so don't be too worried about that. If you wanted to get a perfect even dye, there are many ways of doing that. The best, I think, would probably be using a spray gun. Uh, with an, a compressor, but again, that's a whole different investment, a whole different technique, and uh, I don't have either one of those right now, either the investment or the technique. So, this is my method again. It works well for what I do. It works especially well for smaller pieces, as this is quite big. You may be able to see this a bit longer than, than on a small piece, in terms it may stand out a bit more, uh, but again, this is the kind of thing that will disappear very fast over time. So let's let this dry and we'll come back in a few minutes and buff it. In the meantime, I want to send uh, my friend slash client for, for this project uh, samples of thread against this so that we can choose the color combinations that we'll be using for the stitching. Um, so yeah, again, we'll let this dry and we'll come back to it in a few minutes. I've gone ahead and cut my piece of leather. Now take your time marking things out. Uh, I think this is one of the most important parts of the whole process. I want to get sure that the... Because it's one big piece, I can't really afford to get anything wrong here. I have to make sure that my measurements are absolutely spot on and that no markings are left on the inside because it's a flap mechanism on the front part of the piece, which means that if I get any pe uh, markings from my pen marks basically on the inside, uh, these could be visible once the piece is all set up. So I have to be very careful that all the markings are on the outside of the piece that I want to cut. Um, I did go ahead and modify slightly the original design simply because I thought that the flap needed to be a bit uh, thinner in the center than I'd originally planned for, but uh, it's not a big deal. Just make sure you go ahead and measure out twice. One important thing is to make sure you have a, a metal ruler. Um, the issue with anything that's not metal for rulers is that as you're passing the blade along the ruler, if your blade notches or hits the ruler, uh, you're then going to be stuck with a ruler with the, a small notch on it and can be really annoying uh, for a very long time. So just go ahead and buy metal rulers for this. It does cost a bit more originally, but uh, they last longer and I swear you'll find 
uh, no complaints there with a good aluminium 500mm uh, length ruler. Another thing to note is that I went ahead and uh, sanded slightly the inner corners of my uh, cuts simply because I couldn't really access them with the edge beveler. I'm using a very nice Barry King's Tools edge beveler. I believe this is the number zero edge beveler and it's really nice to get those edges really crisp and uh, gorgeous looking. The idea here is to bevel them in order to be able to dye them and then go ahead and burnish them. Now I'll go into more detail about my burnishing process very soon but uh, this gives you an overview. I did go ahead and add a, a nice crease line all along the inside. I just find it adds a touch of um, yeah, it just makes the piece look a bit more finished than it would have without. Um, I'm not an expert on this, I don't really do it much, so I can't really recommend any specific way of doing it, apart from I like to warm mine up because it leaves a nice clear line, slightly uh, darkening the leather, but there is a fine line between having it uh, nice and warm and having it burn the leather. Uh, I think I had it slightly too warm at first, but uh, I got it to the right temperature afterwards quite easily. Again. Make sure you're testing out some scraps before you do anything to your final piece. That's the most important recommendation today, I think, is to test out before you go ahead and do anything. Uh, I did mark out where my folds were going to be. This is where your measurements come in handy again. Uh, because it's on the parts of the piece that are not going to be visible, it's okay if you go ahead and mark out where your glue is going to be. I'm using a regular cell, um, cement glue, it's a neoprene glue, and as with any neoprene glue you want to apply it on both sides of the leather or both sides of the pieces that you're sticking together and letting that glue dry. In my case I need to let it dry 5-10 to 10 minutes before I can actually glue things up. And once you're all glued up and ready to go, make sure you just let it dr let it dry. Let the piece sit, um, hit out any air pockets, making sure that your two pieces are in getting as much contact as possible and you should be good to go. I let mine dry for about an hour and here we are. We're back guys. This is the piece uh, where I left it just before. Let it dry basically and it's looking really nice. As I mentioned, that leather is feeling just gorgeous. Really, really nice. I can't, I can't really explain it to you um, better than that. The leather is one of those weird products where you can't really explain how it feels. You have to be able to show uh, physically. You have to have it in your hands physically to be able to understand. And the next parts that we are going to be doing right now is cleaning up these edges, making sure that they're flush with a piece of sandpaper. Of course, I did my best while gluing it up to see, make sure that they were as flush as possible. But we'll be sanding these down. Uh, beveling the edges, going ahead and dye the edges and get them ready for a, a nice burnish. And again, I will uh, walk you through my burnishing process then. Um, and then finally, we'll be able to stitch up the corners and add a crease line and add the closing mechanism button here, um, which should be the very last final step. So let's get going. Actually, guys, instead of using sandpaper, we're just going to do one thing much, much simpler than that. Because it's a simple straight line, we're actually going to just go trim that line very, very slightly all down the, down the edge. Uh, and this will mean that we have a nice, clean cut uh, using a very sharp knife for this. And uh, take your time. If you need to come back and do a second pass, that's absolutely fine. Now you could use sandpaper, definitely, that would work, but this is just going to be faster. There we go, and that should give me a really nice clean looking edge, perfect. So that saves a lot of time compared to sanding. There we go. Very easy, very clean. Now all that's left is to bevel. If this had been a piece of uh, tighter tolerances, I may not have been able to just cut all down the edge there, but because of the way this piece is designed, um, I've left myself plenty of margin all around the edges here for this specific kind of thing. So yeah, that makes it easier than trying to sand things down flush. Sanding works great. I mean, don't, you know, honestly, I've used sanding so much in the past on different projects, but it does take time. And if you can just cut flush, then 
that's the fastest method of doing anything really on another craft just cut fast flush and you're good to go I'm using the same dye as previously except this time it's not diluted I'm gently going along with a q-tip just being very careful of not uh, marking my leather anywhere else at this point it's a very very delicate process and you've done so much to your piece now you don't want to make a mistake I do want to sand this very very edge here it's a bit of a harsh edge just on the corner and I'll do the same on the other side just to round off that edge a bit because I couldn't really bevel that so that way I get a nice comfy edge it's not too hard that's the idea be very careful when you've got open dye like this now you can buy some very cool like empty markers that you then fill with whatever dye or ink you want which are great for this kind of application which I definitely need to pick up but in the meantime a q-tip and a bit of patience work just as well Now for burnishing I'm using tokenol and you might have seen me use these gloves. These are cotton gloves sent to me by a subscriber called David. David if you're watching, uh, yes you are completely right. This has changed my view on burnishing and uh, for those of you wondering this is a 100% white cotton glove and I've got a few of them and you can buy them off Amazon very easily and I've linked them down in the description, in the description below uh, bear in mind anything you buy off me off my Amazon storefront uh, really helps me out because it sends me a small percentage of your uh, purchase and uh, that's a really cool way of helping out my channel while getting you yourselves uh, whatever tools and equipment you may need so I've linked these down below and these are amazing now there are different ways of burnishing a piece burnishing is basically using friction and heat to bring these fibers all together and get them solidified now you can use different things for it the most frequent one you'll see is this kind of wood slicker which works great yeah but I don't find it works anywhere as near as well as basically a cotton rag um, now I used to use just pieces of cotton which I'd cut off rags and stuff as you probably see in many of my videos but since David sent me these gloves uh, this has been my absolute go-to the reason for it being well you can use it as a cotton rag but most importantly you can put it on your fingers which means you have absolute control over the edges that you're you're currently burnishing and it has made a huge amount uh, a huge difference to my work and to the final results and um, so yeah David huge thank you first you want to apply a small amount of tokenol to the edge that's going to be burnished and a small amount goes a long way I'm using a uh, just a simple divider here, three millimeter spacing, to mark out where my stitching will be. And then I'll be using a simple, well, not simple necessarily, but I'll be using a stitching punch or a what's it called, a pricking, pricking irons from Crimson Hides, and this is the four millimeter spacing, which means those four millimeters between each hole. And uh, I think it's the French tip or the Japanese, I can't remember, but it's a really cool little stitching punch which will enable me to make some really nice precision stitching. Let me show you. There you are guys, just punched through. Now we're going to be using some Maisie thread. This is their dark green, the M60, so it's 0.6 millimeters thickness. It's going to look like a very cool old-fashioned English classic combination of dark olive green and saddle tan here should be a really nice look and uh, I'm going to be using a basic saddle stitch uh, technique just a very classic uh, off camera so you guys won't be able to see me stitch because it's not necessarily the most interesting thing to watch anyway um, and I will show you the results in a second only thing to note is that this is waxed linen thread 
Uh, I am going to wax it again though, just because I like the knowing that I'm protecting the linen thread for as long as possible by adding more wax, and it helps me during my stitching process because it makes the, the threads a bit more rigid and easier to use. So yeah, let's get going and I'll show you the result. There you go guys, that's what it looks like finally finished, all stitched up with the green Maisie thread. I have to admit it's a very nice and elegant combination, much more than I expected it to be. And uh, yeah, this is shaping up to look really nice. Very nice. Okay. So as mentioned, the final part to do now is go ahead and give it a nice edge crease all around to make it look more finished and add in that final attachment piece. I'm just going to go ahead and use some um, beeswax all around to protect the edges. Now because there was wax all around the edge and uh, with the heat hopefully the waxes have melted a bit inside the leather but I'm just going to give it a final burnish. This will get rid of all the excess wax and help spread it out even more and protect the edges once more. And you don't really need much, just a quick rub, just enough to get it hot and get those waxes flowing again. There we go. As I mentioned, you really don't need much. And that crease turned out really nice. I'm gonna see if I can get you guys some close-up shots. And now the very final part to do is to finish with the attachment mechanism. So just want to fold this quickly, just gently fold it around the edges here just to help it take shape. Not too much, just enough. So I still want to keep it uh, quite firm. I don't want to press down here too much. I still want it to be quite solid. And I'm seeing instantly that uh, this flap is actually way bigger than I would necessarily want. So I, I know roughly where it's going to be. It's going to be roughly about here. But I do want to measure just to be on the safe side. So if I try and make this, let's see, let's use the cutting mat as a guide here, which is about there. That look correct? Yeah, that looks good. And I want an awl and I want to punch straight through because I want to be able to see on the other side where I am. And I am there. A oh, bit of wax sticking to the out side of the bag. There we go. So you guys, this type of scenario is when I wish I had a proper arm press. But we manage, we manage. There you have it guys. Uh, here is the A4 folder or document holder all ready and done and finished. And it's looking really, really nice. I'm very happy with the way the leather turned out and uh, the stitching contrast looks just spot on. That dark olive green looks really nice. Uh, for the next few builds, if I make this again, I may be able to refine a bit this flap, which is a bit big for my liking, but then again, does give you plenty of access or plenty of room to put your hands in and open it up quite quickly. So all in all, very satisfied with this, very happy with the way it turned out, and hopefully my friend will be uh, just as happy as I am with it. Uh, overall, it was a fun little project. And uh, yeah, hopefully it's uh, taught you guys a few things about how I work here and um, yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. So guys, let me know in the comments what you thought of this video. Once again, all the links will be down in the description for my tools and my recommendations that you can find on Amazon. 
Uh, don't think, don't forget that anything you buy off Amazon through those those links helps me out in a small way. I get do get a small kickback on that, and that's a great way of helping out my channel. If you're new to the channel, uh, well, do consider subscribing. That really helps out as well. And uh, whatever the case may be, please leave a thumbs up button, your comments down below, and hopefully I'll see you very soon for some more leather craft.